Thank you everyone for coming uh, to celebrate Matt's uh, completing the book. It's not an easy thing. Um, Matt uh, started SSW uh, as a career change. So he was a sysadmin, came to SSW with no development experience, um, with a lot of tenacity, and uh, it was kind of tested in the, the first days because we have this uh, coding challenge which takes a day of a developer's time. He was here for nearly two weeks. <laughs> 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 Uh, he was very determined, um, like it needs to uh, write a book, obviously, uh, especially a, a book on with new technology. Like uh, it's very easy to write a book on, say, Maui now, when it's been out, and you know there's other resources on the web. But when you're writing it from scratch, you've got nothing to go by. You've got to figure the whole thing out from the beginning, and uh, that's not an easy thing. Um, he. Um, He's been here at SSW for four years. He's become one of the top uh, consultants here. Uh, he has been awesome at leading a lot of projects. Um, you know, it's lovely to work with him. He's uh, a very hard worker. I would say um, uh, he's really focused on uh, mobile, which has been great. Uh, he's taught the other guys uh, a lot of things. Um, and you know, this book is a testament to your excellence, you know, not in everything you do. Uh, I do annual reviews with people uh, all the time, and they often say, oh, look, you know, I want to blog once a month. I've even had some people say once a week. Uh, of course, when you turn around at the end of the year, they haven't done any of that. Um, to write a book and then go through the editing process is not an easy thing. Uh, you've got to make a lot of compromises, you've got to deal with a lot of bugs, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing. Um, uh, I, I want to tell you uh, a quick little story, uh, my first experience with uh, someone that had written a book. Uh, I was much younger and uh, I was running conferences in Sydney and we were flying out these international experts and at the exact same time we had this big insurance job. I hadn't done an insurance job before, it was about $800,000. I took along um, Richard Campbell and Tom Howe. And uh, I, we were trying to talk through how this solution was gonna work. You know, it was a VB6 application. It was gonna have a lot of com objects and things like that. And it got, after we were trying to work out how we were going to develop it, um, the client, uh, ask us, who he was clearly talking to other companies, why, uh, are we, why would we get you to do it? And Tom Howe, he reaches into his, um, his briefcase and he goes, well, I wrote the book on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember seeing that going, wow, that's uh, some response, <laughs> you know? It was pretty, pretty uh, powerful. So, uh, yeah, that would be... That'll be you, Matt. You'll be able to say that. <laughs> Any client asks you, just do that. It's awesome. Yeah, so thank you very much. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Matt. Oh, I should raise a toast. That would be nice. Um, uh, to Matt getting rich off this book <laughs> and to writing a version two. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for being here, and thanks again to our sysadmins and TV team. Okay, so um, I am going to talk about this evening what fills the white space. And what I mean by that is that when you look at a book, you read the printed words and you look at the pictures, um, but it's what's between the words and everything else that you don't see uh, that goes into it. Um, you know, as, as Adam mentioned, it was a... a a lot of effort. It took about two years to write this book. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons I learned from that and some of the things that you don't necessarily expect and some that you probably do, but I'm just going to share my experiences anyway. Um, so a bit about me. My name is uh, Matt. They call me Goldie here. Um, and uh, there is a funny story about that, but I won't, I won't tell it. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm a web and mobile developer. I do security and authentication uh, as well. 
and I am the author of uh, .NET Maui in Action. In case anyone didn't know, I wrote a book. Uh, um, okay, so I am going to talk about my experience of writing a book, and as I said, I'm going to uh, talk about 10 lessons that I learned, some surprising, some not surprising, um, and let's get into the first one. So the un unexpected path to authorship. Um, so the first thing that I want to say uh, about how this book came about and uh, probably mo one of the most important things is a big thank you to Adam. Uh, as he mentioned, I rocked up here four years ago with no experience as a professional developer, um, a lot of um, experience in some passion projects, probably going back about 20 years, 25 years to when I was a teenager and you know, some, used to make games. Um, through to some semi-professional things, uh, through to even as a sysadmin, discovering that I really liked writing code. Uh, and a lot of my sysadmin work would become automated through scripting and that sort of thing. Um, and I got, I got to a point in my career where I, uh, I wanted to make a career change and wanted to be a developer. And it's funny because I, I used to come to SSW to user groups and meetups and events here and hack days. Um, and it was through that experience that I met various people um, and it was only something I was doing, you know, as a, as a hobby. It wasn't anything I was considering as a career. And it was through various people that I met here that said, you know, you should just, just do it. Just do it for a living. Um, and uh, there was uh, uh, two people in particular that kind of made that happen. And one of them is Penny. Um, she uh, befriended me and was uh, very helpful with my ridiculous demands for these events. Um, and the other was Luke who uh, really encouraged me and pushed me to apply to SSW, which I, I would never have considered. Um, and as Adam said, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I had no professional experience as a developer, but I did have a fair amount of consulting experience, which has been very helpful here. But I also have a background academically in science communication. So the thing that I'm actually qualified to do is explain things to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very lucky to wind up at a company that, that really values that. And Adam pushed me to uh, do a lot of writing um, internally. We have a, we have a, a, a rules collection, which has over 3,000 rules, which is uh, about three decades worth of collected wisdom for the company. And Adam uh, con uh, continually pushed me to, to write and contribute to that. And also you know, pushed me to, to present at groups and conferences and that sort of stuff, which I've done as well. Um, so a huge thank you to Adam, because it was actually through that process that, that this book came about. Because uh, what actually happened was um, uh, I did a talk on this technology, which, uh, as Adam said, it, it, it's fairly new. It's called .NET Maui, and it, it's based on an older technology that has existed for a while. But uh, it, was, it was new and it was a refresh of it. And there weren't many people talking about it. And there weren't many people that interested in it. But I was because I, I am very interested in mobile development and I, I do enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I enjoy software development in general um, because I like making things. Uh, and I like, you know, finishing a day's work and knowing that there's something that I've actually made. And for me, mobile development takes it to that ne next level because it's, it's tangible. It's something that you can actually hold in your hands and interact with through touch. Um, and it's just, it's just that level up. So I, I do enjoy that. So there I was doing this talk on this thing that I didn't really think anyone was particularly interested in. It was too new. It was too niche. Um, and then um, shortly after, I got an email from the publisher. Um, and it turns out that there was a kind of... Uh, uh, his, his title was Acquisition Editor, I believe, and his role at the publisher is to, to seek out new opportunities for, for new books. Uh, and he got wind of this talk, and he contacted me, and I showed the email to Adam, and he was like, well, writing a book. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, Adam was, was very well aware of the amount of effort and commitment that was involved. And I, I was under no illusions, and I'll talk about this a bit later. Um, uh, but I, I think Adam probably had a lot better understanding of it than I did. So, so yeah, so, so thank you to Adam, and it, and it was through, through the opportunities that I've had here at SSW that, that this opportunity uh, to write the book came about. Um, some might say that, that I, was, I was lucky, um, but I would like to draw your attention to a well-known quote from uh, Seneca, uh, the Roman Stoic philosopher. And he says, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And, and I really like this saying because um, you know, there's, there's lots of other phrases out there, like uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi famously said, in my experience, there's no such thing as luck. And uh, it, it all goes down to the same thing. You know, luck is, there, is, there is such a thing as randomness, and there is such a thing as chance. 
um, but luck is something you make yourself. And I think when you're presented with an opportunity and you're prepared to seize that opportunity, that's when luck happens. And that's really what happened with me here. And that, and that was kind of a lesson um, <clears throat> for me from this. You know, at the time, I think I'd been here maybe a year and a half, two years. And, you know, I, I wasn't that experienced a professional developer. I'd never written a book before. Um, so, you know, it was this, it was this huge opportunity. Um, but, it, you know, it, and I wasn't prepared for it in the sense that I had prepared to write a book, but I was prepared, I think, in the sense that I was prepared to take on that risk and, and take on that commitment. Um, and for me, I think that's a really valuable lesson um, and certainly one that has been cemented for me through the process of, of, you know, start to finish that initial email from that publisher to standing here today with the printed, printed copies in front of you. So the next lesson, accepting health debt. So what do I mean? Well, in software, we talk about technical debt. So technical debt is, is uh, the concept of when you're writing software or when you're creating uh, a product, there are times when you have to accept that you can't do something the right way for various reasons. Uh, and that might be because budget constraints, time constraints. It may be because of bugs in some package or library that you're depending on. You can acquire, accumulate technical debt through other means as well. You know, you might have a package or something in your software that goes out of date or, you know, a bug is discovered in it. So th this is the concept of technical debt. Um, what I discovered through this was that I, I had to take on health debt. And what I mean by that is that I knew I was going to have to make compromises and sacrifices to, to write this book. Um, I didn't understand quite the level of compromise and sacrifice that it would take. I, I mean, I, I said I was under no illusions, but really when I was writing the book, it was workbook. That was it, right? So I, you know, my, my health suffered not, not through illness, but through, you know, focusing on, you know, not an optimized diet and not exercising as much. My relationship with my family and my friends suffered. Um, and, you know, these were all compromises that, that I had to make. But what I realized is that uh, I incurred health debt through these things. And what I mean by that is you can't just say, I'm going to make this sacrifice, I'm going to make this compromise, and that's fine, I'm writing that off, I'm just going to focus on this one thing. That's debt that you incur, and you have to pay that back. And I had to pay back the goodwill through, from my, my family and through social obligations that I neglected, my side projects and my other hobbies and interests, my health. But the biggest one was my family. And, and you know, I, I would never have been able to write this book if I didn't have the support from my partner keeping our house running at home and our family running at home. And that wasn't something that I could just take for granted and just say, oh, thanks, you know, now I've written a book. I, I have to, uh, you know, you have to pay that back. And, you know, that's something that, that you owe. And I think that's something I've learned through this as well. You know, compromises, sacrifices, they're something that you can do for yourself. But when you make them on behalf of other people as well, that's, that's debt. You could call it health debt. I use the term health debt. You could call it goodwill debt. Um, and there's a quote here from Abraham Lincoln, um, just to summarize that, where he says, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. What was the next lesson? The next lesson is the myth of linear productivity. Now, what I mean by this is that when I started writing the book, when I started out, I started, started with chapter one. And chapter one, it was kind of an intro in history and was very easy to, for me to sit there and write. And, you know, I got smug. I was like, I did 1,200 words on my first day. And then I kept writing and, you know, kept building on this, this word count. And, and I got this idea in my head that productivity meant that word count going up. And every day I expected, that's what I expected of myself. I expected the word count to increase. But I discovered that that's not how it works and that's not how life works. And, and what I discovered was that, you know, there were days when I wouldn't write a single word. And there were days when uh, I wouldn't write a single word because I just couldn't, because I, I wasn't in the right headspace and I couldn't make the words come out. But there were other days when I was working on other things, like uh, some of the demo projects that went into the book, some of the research, some of the graphics and diagrams, uh, some of the, you know, having to understand how it worked now because it's changed since they released the last version three weeks ago. Uh, as Adam said, when it was a new and emerging technology, that was one of the biggest challenges was, was things kept changing and it was very, very frustrating. Um, so what I learned was that I, I, I had to accept on days when the word count wasn't going up that um, 
the work that I was doing on the demo projects or the work that I was doing that was research, or, or you know, some days it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all, but I actually was because I was getting things done that contributed to the book. But perhaps more importantly, there were days where I literally didn't do anything on the book at all. And I, and I said that everything else took a back seat. And on those days, I wasn't working on some other project. There were just days when I, I just needed downtime. And I had to learn to accept that actually that counts as productivity. It counts towards the process of writing the book. Because I didn't ha if I didn't have those days where I could switch off, I would burn out and it just wouldn't happen. So I've got a couple of quotes here that I think summarize that which is uh, uh, John Wooden, who's a, a famous American basketball coach, said, don't mistake activity with achievement. Um, because you know, sometimes you think if you're doing something, it's just busy work and you're not making steps forward. But also, I say, and this is a quote from me, uh, don't mistake a lack of visible output as inactivity. Sometimes the most meaningful work happens behind the scenes. And as I said, you know, that, that's, that's in practical terms, there were things that I was doing that were important for the book but that weren't making the word count go up. But other, other days there were things, you know, there were times when I wasn't doing anything on the book at all, and that was equally a, an important part of the process of getting the book written. Fighting your voice amidst external pressures. Now, anyone that works at SSW can probably relate to this. Um, there are rules about the way that we say things and the way that we do things. Um, and as I said, those rules are based on 30 years of accumulated wisdom through this company. Um, but sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that you can retain your own voice through that. So, so having to do something a specific way or a certain way <clears throat> doesn't mean compromising your own voice. And what I mean by this is the, the, the publishing company, Manning, they also have a large number of rules and they also have very strict, structured, rigid processes about the way this, that they like their books written. Now, as it turns out, all of those are actually excellent, and they're based on uh, evidence and research, uh, and they're all geared towards optimizing the learning experience for the reader. Uh, and a lot of those were, were valuable, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about those because they're really kind of practical lessons. Um, but I've certainly learned a lot about how to write a book and how to communicate things. Um, but there were some things that I just wouldn't compromise on. Um, and there were sometimes there was challenges about finding the right way, right way to do things. So one of those challenges was uh, finding the right level to pitch things at. So the book is aimed at people that know how to uh, write code in C Sharp. Uh, it's not going to teach you to do that from scratch, but you don't have to do anything about .NET MAUI. So the, there's, a, there's a concept called the minimally qualified reader. And what they do is they give you this questionnaire to fill out and you write in detail you know, basically a persona for, for people that might read this book and you explain what type of person it is, what their background is, what they know, what they don't know, so on and so forth. Uh, on the back of the book, it says, for experience.net developers. So that's what that got distilled down to. <laughs> so, um, so that was challenging. And, and you know, it, it, there, was, there was one bit that I agonized over um, where there was a sidebar where I talked about some you know, technology that I mentioned in a paragraph. Um, for those of you here that know .NET, I was talking about link and lambda expressions, which most people know, certainly if you're at an intermediate level. Um, but then there was a question, you know, should I explain? One of the comments from one of the editors, is, should you explain what this is? Uh, and th this was a technical editor, so, so someone that does understand it. And I thought, well, should I, shouldn't I? And I thought, no, it's, I don't want to teach people to suck eggs here. You know, people, they'll, they'll know. And there was a bit of back and forth, and I put it in. And then when it went on to the more general reviewers, uh, and these are people that kind of are interested in the technology, and they actually get paid by the publisher to read early drafts of the book and give feedback. Some, some of them came in and said, this is insulting. We know this. So um, I ended up leaving it in um, because I thought, well, if you know it, just skip over it. Uh, but that was, that was one of the, the challenges. Um, but in terms of finding your voice, uh, there was, uh, so the, the publisher are uh, American. They're US-based. They're based in New York. And they have their own style guide. And they have rules for their editors as well as for their authors. And one of the rules for the editors is uh, American English. So American spelling, American phraseology. Now, as someone that really enjoys writing and really enjoys words, uh, the idea of having my book with American spelling, <laughs> yeah, ma yes, it made me feel <laughs> sick. <laughs> but I got over that. I, I learned to live with it. It's, it's their book, their publisher, and you know the, the vast majority of their target readership is in the US. So 
I, I came to accept that. But when it came to the final editing of the book, and they said to me, you can't use the phrase get to grips because in America the phrase is come to grips. And I was just like, I'm not saying come to grips. I would never in my life use that expression and I'm not prepared to have my name on a book saying that that's something that I wrote because it would just never use it. So I said, you know what? If you don't want me to put get to grips, I won't put get to grips. I'll completely rewrite the sentence. I'm not putting come to grips. And this is just one example. Uh, they actually let me keep get to grips on that one, uh, <laughs> which was good. Um, I think that the, the thought of me going away for several weeks and doing more rewrites didn't appeal to them. Um, so yeah, you, you know, I, I guess the point is um, finding your voice admits external pressures, it's broader. It's about, you know, you've got to understand and accept when there are things that you can't control that you have to compromise on. And there are other things that, that it's perfectly valid to, to uh, not want to compromise on at all. So uh, I will, for this quote, I'll use this one from Hamlet, where he says, this above all to thine own self be true. Um, and I think, I don't think there's anyone here that would uh, argue about the importance of that one. To quote Shakespeare. Why? <laughs> it's it's so good. Right. <laughs> Comment here from the audience that it's cheating, cheating to quote Shakespeare because it's so good. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that's the only Shakespeare quote. Okay, the next lesson. Constructive criticism, a double-edged sword. Uh, Yuli in the audience here with me, we did some work on this earlier this year or last year about yeah. giving and receiving feedback. Um, and it, it is tricky. You know, most people want to improve and get better at things, but nobody particularly likes being told what you've done isn't good, right? Now, what's helpful is if someone says there's a better way of doing what you've done. So that's useful. Uh, constructive criticism is, is very useful, and, and I welcome it. Uh, you know, if you're just attacking someone blindly, that's, that's not particularly nice, but constructive criticism is, is good. And I had to learn a lesson, right? So uh, uh, the lesson that I had to learn is that being good at writing doesn't make you a good writer. And, you know, it's funny, I, I said that this, this publisher approached me a couple of years ago and I'd never written a book before, but truth be told, I, I've dreamed of writing a book for as long as I can remember, and I really, really enjoy writing and I enjoy the process of using words and trying to construct something that, that flows nicely and is beautiful and easy, easy to read and easy to say. And, and that's a, a craft and a process that I enjoy, but that doesn't make you a good writer. And, and with, with Manning, you know, this isn't, this isn't just a free for all, you know, it's not a diary, right? You know, I can't just write what I want to write. This, this is based on rules and structure. And as I said, evidence-based rules that, that help you actually teach. So I had to learn those and I had to learn to write in a way that was effective to, to communicate and achieve the goal. So that was the first thing. But the hardest part of this process was uh, I, I got assigned an editor who worked with me throughout the process of writing this book, uh, several editors actually, but, but the main one, his name was Connor, and he was my development editor. And that meant that he read every word of every draft that I wrote the whole way through and gave me feedback. And some of his feedback was incredible. It was really useful. And a lot of his feedback, especially early on, was, was you need to do this this way because this is what the evidence and research shows is the right way to do it. And some of his feedback made me want to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> And not because it wasn't good feedback, it was really good feedback, but sometimes he'd drop in like a two sentence, word, a two sentence comment that, you know, I'd look at it and I would say, there's literally no way of me achieving what you're saying here without throwing away this whole chapter and rewriting the whole thing. Um, so I, I, you know, I came to learn through quite quickly because I had to, through the process of working with him, that uh, that wasn't always what he meant. And sometimes his suggestions were just suggestions. Um, and it, it took a while, but we developed a synergy and we, we developed a, a rhythm uh, and we got into a process of, of working quite well together. And that was one of the early challenges of, of, of this project, of, of working on writing this book. And once we got over that, things, things moved much more quickly. So I've got a quote here from Winston Churchill where he says, Criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fulfills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to an unhealthy state of things. So yeah, so criticism, it's, it's hard, it's hard to take, but when it's constructive, it, it's good. But there's also, uh, there's a skill to learn, which is uh, what criticism to take on board and what not to. And uh, yeah, as I said, you, Yuli and I have done some work on that and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have something to share on that one day. 
Six, perseverance through emotional highs and lows. So I, I probably don't need to uh, explain too much about what I'm talking, talking about here. Uh, you know, the, the process of writing the book was um, hard on me and on my family. Um, not just the process of actually writing the book and not just learning what I needed to learn to write it, but the toll it took on my life. And, you know, when I was actually writing the book, there were certainly times where I was just loving it. I was loving what I was writing. I was loving the demo projects I was building. I was just loving all aspects of it. But there were other days when uh, that wasn't the case. And there were days when it, the, the process of writing the book was hard. There were days when work was hard and, you know, you have a hard, stressful day. You don't want to write a book after that. There were days when, you know, there were ups and downs with family and, you know, days when I felt terrible for the amount of neglect that I uh, inflicted upon my family. Um, and, you know, some days it's easy to do it and some days it isn't. And, and for me, what I did to, to push myself through that was visualizing the day when the hard copy, printed copies would arrive. For me, that was my goal and that was my vision. And I just kept thinking, that's what I want to do. And, and also, as I said, I've you know, been dreaming of writing a book for a long time. Um, and I heard uh, a saying once, and, and from what I understand, this isn't attributable to anyone. It's kind of a, a well-known saying in, in the writing community, which is that the difference between someone who's an author and someone who isn't an author is simply that an author is someone who has written a book. And I, and I thought back to all of my abandoned writing projects. I read another book once about um, uh, teach yourself writing novels or writing novels for dummies. And I read early on that uh, there's something called the five chapter problem, which is that you start writing a book and you know you get to the fifth chapter and then you kind of stop because you, you lose the wind in your sails. So I went back to my writing projects folder and looked at all of my writing projects. There was five chapters in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that, mo that motivation kept me going. And I, I, I thought, you know, enough. I want to be an author. I want to finish this. And, and especially having heard that saying that, you know, the difference between... Because, you know, I, I guess I considered myself a, a you know, an author who just hadn't written a book yet, but that makes you by definition not an author. So that's what, that's what kept me going. So for this one, I will quote Batman. That's cheating. 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 That's so good. It's not who I am underneath, it's what I do that defines me. And I think this is so important. I know, I know it's, from, it's from Batman, but I just, I just really think this is such an important quote. And I, I beg your pardon? You've got to say it with the voice. You've got to say it with the voice. It's not who I am underneath. <laughs> it's what I do that defines me. <laughs> Lesson seven, when the end feels like the beginning. Well, you know, I, I, I spoke about my motivation and my, my visualization of the day then the, uh, the books arrived, the printed copies. Whew. Expectations were not quite the reality. <laughs> So after probably 18 months of writing this book, I finished it. Well, I thought I finished it. <laughs> I'd, I'd written the last word of, you know, I'd written the last chapter and the last appendix, and, you know, the, it had gone to the editors, and I'd done my revisions, and as far as I was concerned, over, done. But then began the process of what they call sending it to production. And what that meant was taking my manuscript and getting it essentially to this printed book. And that involved so much. And, and there was so much more to do. There was graphics revisions. There was layout reviews. There was uh, even some rewrites, actually, because there were some things that other editors picked up. And then sometimes the, the typesetters would say, this won't work on the page like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was so much, so much more to do. And uh, yeah, you know, by the time those books arrived, you know, I, I, I always had this vision in my head that they'd arrive and I'd had this, this, this feeling of elation and, you know, excitement and euphoria of opening the book, uh, the box and holding the book in my hand and being so excited. And it's not that it was disappointing, it's just I didn't have any of that. It was, it was just such a drawn out process that by the time I got there, it just wasn't, it just wasn't what, I, what I had been visualizing. And, and, and funny, I, I'll, I'll tell another story. Sometimes I like to tell people uh, about something I did a long time ago, uh, even though it was a long time ago and I can't really rest on those laurels anymore. But I, I did an Ironman. Um, does anyone here know what an Ironman is? A few people? Nearly everyone. Okay. Well, a, an Ironman is a, a very, very long triathlon. Um, and I, uh, I made a commitment to do it um, over the course of two years to train and then do it. And uh, through the course of this time training for it and preparing for it, 
again, I visualized, right? And uh, the, the, what I was visualizing was crossing that finish line. When you cross the finish line of an Iron Man, an announcer says your name, says you are an Iron Man. And I kept thinking in my head, just visualizing and picturing crossing that finishing line and, and just hearing that voice, Matt Goldman, you are an Iron Man, and just thinking how wonderful that would sound. And then the day got there and I crossed the finish line. I didn't even hear them say it. Like, <laughs> um, I, I, I just wanted to die. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so in, a, in a way, um, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're, there were similar experiences, and similar in terms of the effort and commitment and sacrifice and compromise, and similar, and I guess in the anticlimax of the end there, but I, I still, you know, I don't think that's what's important, and I, and I don't think you do these things for that one moment, you know, the fireworks and the celebration and the parade. It's not about that. It's about, you know, I, I've written a book, and I'm very proud of that, and, and I've done an Ironman, and I'm very proud of that, and, and I think... Um, those are the things to focus on. You know, the visualizations of those moments, they may come, they may not come. Um, you know, they're what get you through it, but you know, you don't necessarily get those things and you know, that, but that's not what's important. Um, and uh, as Rolf Waldo Emerson said, the reward of a thing well done is having done it. And that's, that's really a takeaway for me from this book. Now with that said, <laughs> validation and the true reward, right? As it turns out, you know, the thing that, that I found most rewarding and most validating through this process was, was not that, that moment of elation, that, that celebration or parade, which, which didn't happen. But um, some interesting things did start to happen. Now, like I said, I, I, I worked hard on this book and I am proud of it, uh, you know, and, and having never written a book before, you know, it's easy enough for me to say I think I did a good job. But when I started getting validation of that from the editor and the publisher and they were saying, you know, this is, this is one of our better books and we're really really pleased with it, I was, that blew me away and I was so pleased to hear that. But probably the, the, the biggest thing was uh, when I started seeing people post on social media about it and I started seeing people posting that they'd bought this book and that they were learning from it and that it was valuable and it was really good and, and it, that wasn't something that I'd visualized and I wasn't prepared for it but that really, really blew me away and that was absolutely the most validating thing of all and you know, really makes it, makes it feel worthwhile. Happened, happened just this week actually. I got a comment on LinkedIn from someone who said that he was buying the book and that, that he was enjoying it. And it just, it, it, makes, it, it makes it feel worthwhile. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, again, uh, said, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Uh, so yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, for me, that's, that's the most valuable thing of all, at least until the day and I can walk into a client meeting and say, well, I wrote the book. <laughs> But what about boundaries and future commitments? Would I ever do it again? Would I write a book again? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Uh, am I fired? It depends. <laughs> uh, yeah. So look, like I said, I, I was under no illusions about the book. I didn't think it was going to be something I was going to breeze through or something that would be easy, but. I wasn't prepared for how all-consuming it would be. I didn't, I didn't understand or appreciate that, that it would be my life in totality. I thought, you know, I thought other things would have to take a back seat and be downplayed you know, a lot, you know, not even just a little bit, but the truth is they had to be eliminated completely. Um, and, and I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I certainly have an appreciation for that now and, and certainly have a, a bigger appreciation for um, what's involved in writing a book. Um, so would I write, write a book again? Well, actually, the publisher asked me uh, within days of it being sent to the printers whether I was happy to start work on a second edition. Um, now, if I'd have said yes to that, I would have had to have found somewhere else to live. <laughs> so I said no. Um, and and I, look, I would, I would love to write a book, um, and uh, another book, and I've got certainly lots of things I would like to write about, both in terms of tech and I would also very much love to write a book one day that anyone could read. Of course, this book is so well written that anyone, even non-technical, could read it and just enjoy it. Um, but, you know, I've, I've definitely established some rules, and one of those is no emerging tech. I would never, ever do that again. I would never write a book again on something that's being developed as I was writing it. It's just, it's too hard and too stressful. And the other thing that I would have to think very carefully about is... You know, with this book, I, you know, I signed a contract and I had deadlines and I had a commitment to write the book and that was so helpful and, and you know, like it really keeps you on task and it keeps you writing the book. Um, but I think 
in all likelihood, I would probably not do that again. And, and I think, you know, especially now that I kind of understand the process, I would probably try to have the bulk of it done next time and then maybe approach a publisher. And that might mean that it takes 10 years instead of two years, but I think that's an easier 10 years. Um, and also now that I've got one book under my belt, that's a luxury that I'm afforded that, that other people don't have. So I would definitely, you know, leverage that. Now, you know, there are people that do technical writing for a job full time. Um, and, you know, I, you know that's, that's different. But in terms of, you know, taking on a commitment like that again on top of a full time job, on top of family commitments and everything else, uh, just, just no, I, I, I just wouldn't, just wouldn't do it. No. Just no, just no. So maybe I'll write another book, but, but yeah, it would be under very different circumstances. Um, so Jane Porter, who's actually an author, um, she has this saying where she says, uh, you can't set boundaries without setting consequences. And I think it's important to recognize that the boundary setting is about setting boundaries for yourself. And as, as much as it's about setting boundaries for others, but you can only set consequences for yourself. So, you know, you can set boundaries for other people as much as you like, but you can't really stop people violating your boundaries. All you can do is decide what you're going to do when that happens. So, you know, what I mean in that sense is that, you know, if I were to take an, in this, you know, in this example, if I were to take on another book and I, you know, decided these are my boundaries. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll tell a, a bit more of the story. So in the contract that I had with the publisher, there was a clause that said that uh, if I wasn't meeting their expectations in terms of progress, they reserved the right to bring in another author. So someone else to come along and help me or potentially even replace me. And I was just like, hell no, that is not happening. This is my first book, I'm gonna write the book, I want my name on the cover and I'm gonna do it. Um, I would potentially reconsider that boundary if I were to do this again, because you know certain things are more important. Um, but uh, uh, equally, you know, in, in terms of if the publisher decided to turn the screws and put more pressure on me, I may well decide to, that that's a boundary that I wasn't prepared to cross. But the consequence that I can set to that is, you know, I can't say no to the publisher to bring someone else in. The, the consequence is that I would have to be prepared to accept that and have to be prepared to walk away. And that's what the boundaries are about. It's, it's about what you're prepared to do under different circumstances. So the last lesson is I, I want to talk about the dream versus the reality. Um, as I said, I've been dreaming about writing a book for a long time. And um, I think a dream of mine and potentially any aspiring author really uh, is to one day walk into a bookshop and see your book on the shelves. And I just, you know, that's, that, that's a real dream and, and that's something that, you know, I think that, that I would always have liked to see. Now, of course, the problem is that um, this technology, it's a niche within a niche and uh, it's a niche within a niche uh, and, you know, bricks and mortar bookstores are, are on decline uh, because of obviously competition from online. Technical manuals like this, there's availability of online resources, the things change so often, uh, shelf space is at a premium. So, you know, I, I, I kind of thought that, um, you know, that wouldn't be the kind of thing that, that I would ever see, it would be, you know, going into a bookshop and seeing my book on a shelf. But, you know, <laughs> dreams can come true. Good question. So if I go back, I'll just get to this quote from Michael Jordan. I have my slides in the wrong order. Some people want it to happen, some wish it to happen, and others make it happen. Yes, I made that happen. I took my book into a bookshop and put it on the shelf. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Tom. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that the publisher gave you a deadline. May I ask, like, how long did that last? Years, five years, five years ago. Um, the first deadline, or the second deadline, or the third deadline? <laughs> um, it, it was 12 months. Um, I, I negotiated that up to, I think, 14 months um, because I, you know, I just said it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, and then I missed that deadline. And no one really said anything about it, uh, not by much. Um, but then, you know, it was, I don't know, it was a, a couple of weeks or something, and then it was done. But then there was that production process. And I think 
maybe that was all supposed to be compressed within that deadline. No, actually, no, sorry, now that I think about it, the deadline was specifically that, that an accepted version of the manuscript had to be accepted by them. So, so yeah, so the other stuff wasn't part of that deadline. But if you want to do something like this, they will, they will in all likelihood, say 12 months. Uh, Yuli. <laughs> so you were writing a book about technology that wasn't even out yet. Like, it was really emerging. Where did you get your information? Uh, so so Yuli, Yuli said I was writing a book about a technology that wasn't out yet um, and asked where I got my information. Uh, a few places. One is that, as I said, it was kind of based on an earlier technology, so there was a lot of experimentation and trial and error and, and try and discover what the differences were. Uh, then there was the source code, because it's an open source product. Sometimes I had to look at that and try and figure out what was going on. But I also had uh, a technical editor assigned to the book, and he's one of the engineers that works on the team. So if there were any questions that I had, um, I was able to go to him. And I, I didn't need to that much. Um, but I take, uh, for me, more than anything, it was a safety net of knowing that they're not going to let me publish something that's completely wrong, because yeah. he's going to going to stop it. Yeah. Cool. Sean? Yeah, well, I'll seize the opportunity to say how much like, I'm amazed by what you've done. And you said that you're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like, I've been working with you for a few years now. And Thank you very um, much. Now, yeah, you worked on an emerging technology that kept on changing. So how do you manage that? Like, when a new version comes out and you've got to rewrite chapter one and change the entire course of explaining the thing, I haven't read the book yet, I just bought it. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure, sure you've done an amazing job with that. Uh, but how do you manage that? Like, you know, being, keeping changing and keeping evolving, like, how do you, oh, hello, Mine. How do you how did you manage it? So so Jean's asking it was a it was a book uh, it was a technology that was just coming out and emerging and things were changing and sometimes I'd have to go back and and write rewrite large portions of it and how do I manage that how do I deal with that well I cried a lot uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't really have a strategy for that or a technique. It was just something that I had to accept. So sometimes something would change and I would have to go back and rewrite something. Other times something would change and I would have to go, go back and rewrite everything. And the most, the most painful parts were... Um, so for the first, I think, four or five, six chapters, um, there are some little individual projects, little small throwaway projects. But then from there, for the rest of the book, there's a major project. Um, so each chapter builds on the previous chapter. So you know, by the time I got towards the end, and then there were big changes, I had to go back and redo everything, and it was it was hard. And um, I I don't have a, a strategy for that. It was it was just time and effort, just something I had to do. Yeah. Liam. Would you recommend it for anyone else? Um, the question from Liam is, would I recommend it for anyone else? The book, yes. <laughs> the process. Uh, the process of writing a book. Look, if it's if it's something that you want to do, um, it, yeah, and it's you've got something to say and, and something to work on, then yes, I would recommend it. Like I said, I, I'm proud of it and, and I would love for everyone to have that feeling uh, and that sense of accomplishment. Uh, you know, now that it's done, uh, that can't be taken away. I've written this book, it's done, you know, and, and uh, I, would, I would certainly love for everyone to have that feeling. So yes, I would recommend it. Um, and I'm more than happy to give a copy of this presentation to anyone that is considering it. <laughs> Penny. One of the things I thought was cool and a little bit interesting was you were releasing chapters almost as you wrote them online. Like I was seeing, you know, people reading them from the beginning being released before the print version. Are those chapters different to what's in the book now? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So the publisher have um, a process called MEEP, which is Manning. Uh, Manning is the publisher. Manning Early Access Program. Um, and, and Penny was asking about, she was saying that I was releasing chapters chapter by chapter as, as it came out. Um, and were those chapters different to what's in the book? The answer is yes. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is from feedback that I got from people reading those early draft chapters. Um, you know, some of the feedback was, was um, incredibly helpful. Like, and some of it was quite challenging. Like I said, there are people that said, you know, this is, this is obvious and too simple. Don't put this in here. It's insulting. Um, so that was challenging, but but some of the feedback was just phenomenal and, and really useful, and certainly you know catching errors. Uh, now I have to say I've read a lot of technical books that have got errors in them when they go to print, and you know what I, I'm sure there are errors in here, but the process of Manning is is so 
meticulous and there's so many people that read it and get eyes on it before it goes to print it, it really gives you a lot of confidence that that what you end up with is you know is, is going to be relatively error free it's a it's a big big team of people involved this is like version 10 uh well there are 12 chapters in it <laughs> um and each chapter would probably have five or six versions so it's probably like version 100 or something yeah Anyone Any other else? Questions? questions? I think Tom has another question. Yeah. Does it mean now you can go through all the readmes of all our projects and fix them up? Does it mean that I can go through all the readmes of all our projects and fix them up? Certainly, if that's something that Adam wants to allocate my time for, I can do that. <laughs> Yuli. So I just checked, and we've got 12 rules to better .NET MAUI at the moment. Is that like a nice summary of the book, or do we have to read the whole book? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I wrote those rules and the book, so... Um, Which one was first? <laughs> The book started before, the, which one was first? The book started before the rules, the rules finished before the book. Um, look, the, the, the rules to, to better.net Maui are much more high level than this. And there's, there's certainly a lot of valuable lessons in there and some important um, high level information in there. But the, the book obviously goes into a lot more detail. <laughs> Kiki. I know this is very recent, but have you got any like negative feedback on social media and people just bow, bad mouth in the, the book or something like that? Um, so the, the question is, uh, uh, it's, he knows are there any haters? <laughs> I, I, that is the question is, is are, are, there, are there any haters? Um, not, not yet. Um, I did get, I, there, was a, there was a Reddit post on, on a .NET Maui Reddit where someone uh, you know, the, the title of the post was, is anyone reading .NET Maui in action? And I thought, oh God, what's this going to say? <laughs> so, so I looked at it, and, and the first thing it said is, it's quite good. I was like, oh yeah, but, oh. <laughs> um, and he, he had some comments, and a, a complaint really, about some of the code samples that he was reading. Um, and I responded to that, and, and I said, you know, hi there, I'm the author of this book. I'm sorry that that's happening. You know, what are you having a problem with? And I looked at it, um, and it turned out that the version that he was reading was not the print version but um or not even the final digital version but the live book version and that's um what penny was saying earlier about the early access one was you can read it on the website and that's what he was doing and and by some strange twist of the way that they organize things that's the one that gets updated last um so so anyway i, I ended up uh, resolving that with that one person so uh, but other than that um no i haven't had any any haters yet so but it's early days <laughs> Anyone else questions? <laughs> Hi again. Hi, Yuli. <laughs> so um, if you had written like, you know, Silverlight in action, right, you might have been sad next year. Uh, did you have that fear with Don't Maui? I, uh, yes. Um, so the question was, if I had written uh, Silverlight in action, I would have been sad the next year. So for those that don't know, Silverlight was a technology that Microsoft uh, had and it was it was it was very very good um, and it, uh, unfortunately it was a browser plugin and browser plugins in general browser plugins for for running apps uh, so there was also Flash which a lot of people know um, they ended up dying a death um, not because there was anything wrong with Silverlight um, or Flash well there was lots wrong with Flash um, <laughs> but they basically those things died because Apple refused to support them on the iPhone. So, uh, you know, at that point, that was the death of all these kind of plug-in based application frameworks. Um, so that's why Silverlight died. And if I'd have written a book on Silverlight and, and it, it got retired the next year, yeah, I probably would have been sad. Uh, with .NET MAUI, if, if Microsoft decide to retire it, I will be sad. And I will be sad because, as I said, I'm proud of what I've done. And I think it's a good book. And I think people can learn from it. And I would like to, people to learn from it. And if they don't have that opportunity, um, I will be sad. However, I've still written the book, and, and, I, and I don't think that that's ever going to be something that you know I'll be sad about. I think that's a wrap. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.